on. We are continuing on our waiting formulas. And we have Professor Tammy Colby from UBM, right? And she was the consultant on this bill. And Professor, I think we've been told our first job is to decide if we're going with weights or equity payments, or it's been suggested we could do a combination. Um, I think we're still trying you know, in a couple of days to get a hand, our minds around several long months of work and looking what are the pros and cons uh, that you see with either system. And then some concern about wide shifts. Um, we're gonna take a look at some unnamed cases to see if we can, but we understand at least one school is going down $10 million. And we have to look at that kind of impact on the ed fund. So the floor is yours. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for the record, Tammy Colby. Um, I'm an associate <laughs> professor of education policy at the University of Vermont. And I was one of the co-authors on the waiting study, um, along with my colleagues at the American Institutes of Research and Rutgers University. Um, I, I thought I, I shared some PowerPoint slides as a PDF in advance. Um, I also thought it might be helpful if I shared my screen with those slides. I, and yes, so, those, that would be helpful. Yep. Um, what I would say is, is that uh, I know that this, I, I, I think about this stuff all the time. So, you know, I, I know that when we're talking and going through these kinds of things, sometimes for the first time, there are immediate questions that come up that are clarifications that would be helpful in the moment. If you have one of those, just stop or put something in the chat and I'll try to, I'll try. So don't, don't feel the need to save questions for the end if it's going to be the case that not having the answer or clarification to a question is going to impact your ability to sort okay. of understand things. So I, I always, a please, the I always of appreciate word. everyone's deference and being polite, okay. but I also, yeah. my job here is to be useful to you today. So I want to make sure that I'm able to answer your questions as they come up. So let me share my screen here. Um, and I pulled together some brief slides for us to think about today. And we'll start from the beginning. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is, is to start out by saying a little bit about history. I know there's been a lot of conversation around the people waiting study. I think it's important to sort of understand and level set where we are right now. Um, the first thing I'll say is our initial study was commissioned by the legislature. We submitted a report in January of 2020, and then COVID hit. And so there's been some time now since, since the study's results have come up. Um, the task force in implementing the recommendations, uh, both Senator Rock and Senator Hardy were part of this summer. Um, they made two additional requests back to our team. Um, for some additional analyses. One was the first request to update or recalculate the weights based on some revised assumptions. And those recalculations came back in a memo on October 28th. Um, and then there was a second request for some additional information on how they might calculate a cat, um, aid amounts for categorical grants, um, where we developed per pupil cost estimates in that, and also some design considerations around those. And that all came back to the General Assembly in the form of a memo on January 11th. So there are these three documents really sort of floating out there right now. There's the original study, and then there's these two updates. And so just so that we're all on the same page, um, the updates all are summarized in one table in your handouts, okay? So we have the proposed weights off of the, that are the revised weights, and these reflect the new assumptions about how we measure poverty, and also that the weights would be additive. We also have categorical grant amounts, one in fiscal year $18, the other one in fiscal year $23, which has just been escalated for inflation. And over here in column four are the categorical grant amounts that JFO pulled together for the task force report because our estimates were not yet available and they used slightly different methodology. Our numbers are very close. So I just want everybody to have that in front of them as we're talking through. My understanding here is that the proposals on the table are twofold. 
One, excuse me, I keep bumping my mouse, um, is to update the existing weights that are in the formula, or two, to, um, to move in a different direction towards these new cost equity grants. And I've been asked to evaluate these policy proposals. I think Senator Cummings said, you know, pros and cons. What I want to do is I just want to, I want to, I want to do, I want to present my analysis with some, some parameters around it for you. First of all, the way, the way that I'm approaching my analysis is that both of these policy proposals have shared goals. And those shared goals are to put in place a fair and efficient mechanism for adjusting for differences in educational costs. I think that's really important for us to remember, right? What, what are these weights? What are these grant payments supposed to do? They're supposed to adjust for differences in costs across school districts that are outside of school district control. And the other consideration we have to have here is that we're thinking about these cost adjustments within Vermont's existing school policy framework, which is unique, very unique in the country. It's right, most states operate foundation formula. We don't operate anything close to that. So what it means is that conversations around weights and categorical grant programs, we have to think about how those policy options might interact with these other design elements that are embedded in our funding formula already. And the two big ones we have to take into account when we're thinking this through, I call them Vermont specific considerations, are is the priority placed on local control, that is, localities get to decide how much they spend. And two, we have this self equalizing system for how we generate revenue. Those two features are very unique among states. And so any conversation around these options has to take into account the, the, uh, the interactions between what we might do for cost adjustments and how they might interact with these Vermont specific considerations. The other thing I just want to say out front is that both of these proposals are viable proposals. And so back to that goal, what we're trying to do, I think, is as policymakers in a state is try to figure out like, which one's going to be most fair and most efficient. Right? How do we have but being fair and efficient may also mean that there's we don't get it perfect. In fact, there is no such thing as a perfect funding formula. So there are going to be trade offs. And so in talking through these pros and cons and cons, what I'm really talking about here are trade offs that we have to that I, I'm going to suggest that policymakers need to consider as they're deliberating sort of option one or option two. With that background, make sure I want to highlight just what is the role the weights currently play in our existing formula because I think that's our comparison case okay the weights in the existing formula proportionally adjust for differences in local spending that are outside control right economically disadvantaged children English language learners and they do so in a way that spending is adjusted so that it the end towns have equivalent tax rates for equivalent cost adjusted spending right so weights are this fundamental policy lever in our funding formula that are intended to ensure both student and taxpayer equity at the same time that's a tall order right and the architects of act 60 actually were pretty smart when they came up with this equalized pupil calculation although it is different than how other states use weights, it does work, right, within our system of local control and with our self-equalizing revenue generating system. So what are some of the advantages to weights generally in Vermont's formula? Because weights, Vermont's formula operate differently than weights in other people's formula, other states. First of all, weights equalize spending because we're adjusting spending decisions. We're adjusting them proportionally while still allowing locals to make some spending decisions. And second, when they're appropriately calculated, and our study suggests that our weights right now are not appropriately calibrated, they fairly and efficiently adjust for these differences in cost. And they encourage spending by needier districts and disincentives overspending by less needier districts, right? So the intent of the weights is to equalize opportunity, to level the playing field, bring the bottom up, keep the top from spending off the top. That said, 
they're not perfect, right? And the task force, I think, did a good job and of identifying some of the challenges with the weights. One, they require regular recalibration. One of the, one of the part of the situation we have right now is the weights have not been recalibrated ever, right? In fact, they were just kind of rolled over to the best of anybody's knowledge, right? From the existing foundation formula in 1997. So not, they're not cost-based, nor have they been calibrated as time goes along. But I will say that regular recalibration is the case with any approach to cost adjustment. Um, the fact that we've basically not talked about or touched our cost adjustments in so many years is pretty unusual for a state. The other sort of, I guess, challenge with weight in an equalized people calculation is that they're complicated to explain to taxpayers and citizens. Um, I get that. Um, I would say, though, that um, I think this is also a general critique of Vermont's entire school funding system, and it's also not isolated to weights. We operate one of the most complicated school funding systems in the country. Um, and I would say that the tax force did a really nice job of identifying some strategies that could be put in place that make the weights easier to understand um, and simplified. In particular, their recommendation for new po using new poverty measure and for moving to additive weights. And then the third challenge that is sort of percolated here is that there, that the weights they don't really have an influence over or it's very difficult to have accountability for local spending decisions, right? The reality is, is that's the case pretty much no matter what we do with cost adjustments, unless there is legislative appetite for making other kinds of statutory and regulatory changes, right? Either proposal, this is a challenge. So it's not so much an issue with the weights themselves, but with the existing policy preferences that we have for local control and regulatory limits for AOE and current EQS, the educational quality standards. That brings us to option two, the cost equity grants. Um, and let's talk about what in fact those are, right? They're essentially what we in the school funding community would call reverse foundation grant. They're a fixed dollar amount that is a that goes out on a per pupil basis. And it is intended this dollar amount to offset the costs, these additional costs, either in whole or in part, incurred by school districts. Why is it a reverse foundation formula? Because usually what happens when we have this kind of um, categorical grant program, it's applied to a consistent base, right? There's a foundation amount and then we add on top. This is, this is a reverse. We're taking these dollars and we're applying them to different bases. Right, which are different different local decisions about average spend. But either way, a local school district would get a fixed dollar grant for a specified category of students that are in these grants are intended to offset costs. But we have to remember that the grant amounts are equivalent to the average additional spending needed. Right, and I'm gonna talk a lot about the average here in a minute, but it's important to recognize that these are average spending levels. So this is the average additional costs we would expect, for example, for an economically disadvantaged student or an ELL student or a small school or a geographically isolated school. We're talking about the average. And the average is really the only way to kind of do this unless we move to sliding scales or something along those lines, which is very difficult to estimate in the Vermont context because we have so many small schools and it's very difficult to come up with sort of reliable scale estimates. So what then might be some design considerations that go along with the cost equity proposal? These are things that, that policymakers might need to think about if they're going to go down this road. And the first one is this issue of average costs. So we have to recognize that grant amounts based on average cost estimates will either provide too much or too little for many districts, right? The average is just that, it's the middle. That may be okay, right? But we have to recognize that that's in fact what they're going to do. And the other thing is, is that the grants may operate as a spending threshold. And what this could do is it could result in new kinds of inequities and opportunities to learn. What do I mean by that? What it means is that let's pretend that the grant is $5,000 for a economically disadvantaged student. I'm making that number up, right? But a school district really needs to spend $7,500 per pupil based on their local conditions and the extent of need, their district. 
right? It could be that because the grant amount is $5,000, the school district may opt or the local taxpayers may opt to cap spending at $5,000 rather than spending what it is, the additional $2,500. And if they actually spent the $7,500, whereas other school districts capped, what will be is that we'll have some districts based on tax preferences and tax sort of capacity, and local voters. It will be, it could be the case that some districts are actually spending more per pupil than other districts. And in doing so, we create a new system of advantages and disadvantages. Again, these are design considerations and I'll talk about it at the very end. These are all things we can design around. These are just considerations that we have to take into account about potential kind of unwanted effects. Second thing we have to think about is that this issue of proportionality, which is what all districts receive the same dollar amount per pupil as a cost adjustment. The, unlike a foundation formula where we're applying it to a stable base, such as $10,000, that's what everybody gets. And then we put these things on top. The effective way to proportionally as a cost adjustment is going to vary by district. And because of that, the grants don't equalize costs. Right? And that's one of those key tenets in our existing funding formula for the right for our for the equalization to work for both taxpayers and students, the cost adjustments have to effectively equalize costs as specified by school budgets. What categorical grants do is they off some portion of the additional costs and they will do so right to greater and lesser extents in certain school districts. So the extent of the total offset is going to depend on spending levels in a district. There's also been discussion of what in economic terms we like to talk about the flypaper effect. And what the flypaper effect is, well, one advantage of a cost of a grant is that the dollars stick. So now we know five thousand dollars is what we should be spending, for example, on an economically disadvantaged student, and we can build some policies around that to make sure those dollars stick to economically disadvantaged students. I think we just have to recognize that that can be the case, but that also will require changes to statute and regulation. Currently, there's no way to ensure that districts, in fact, spend dollars for a particular purpose. But this is no different than the current policy with the weights. And so remember I said, like, these are those considerations. Like if we, if we start to think about option two, these are some of those other kinds of policy parameters that we might need to take into account. And then we know from quite a bit of existing research that categorical funding can, may introduce new administrative inefficiencies into the funding system. There are transaction costs, right? And we can, we've seen those kinds of transaction costs in the state with running other categorical programs. But again, that's a trade-off. It doesn't necessarily make it a fatal flaw. The other things we have to think about are some of the advantages here, right? With a cost equity proposal. And one of the big ones that we've heard about and the task force talks about is sort of transparency and predictability. In fact, that was a goal of the task force, really try to think this through. And certainly districts being able to say, I'm going to get this amount of money per pupil, regardless of local spending decision, is transparent and predictable. And there's also this potential to attach new types of monitoring and accountability for local spending, right, through other kinds of statutory means and regulation. Um, but we have to be careful about that because that can turn into create other kinds of equity concerns for monitoring accountability where districts who are who may receive cost adjustments and others that don't. That means some districts might have certain monitoring and accountability provisions where other, others don't. Again, something we have to think about as we're designing policy. What are some limitations I think we need to think about? The first big one I, 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 I alluded to before, and that is this issue of, oh gosh, I keep, why is it doing this today? Excuse me. Um, is to think about this issue of, of categorical grants as an adjustment versus cost equalization. That that's a that's kind of an important thing because our entire system. Remember, I talk about the weights being that lever. The weights are the lever for ensuring sort of these dual goals of student equity and taxpayer equity. And if we're not equalizing costs in a way that balances two things, and we're just adjusting for costs. And remember, I talked about the adjustments are going to be uneven because of the average. That's that's a trade-off. That's a trade-off that we have to consider. 
The second thing, as I mentioned around equity concerns, it is likely because some districts will in fact get more money than they need with an average payment, and they are likely to spend up to those dollars, which means they're spending more money than they need to. And other districts will not get as much as they need because of the average, is that it could widen the gap between the top and the bottom spenders in the state. We already have a pretty big path gap between the top and the bottom spenders that really has been precipitated by the fact that our weights are already miscalibrated. And so unless we think about that and we're thoughtful about that, it is unlikely that the cost equity proposal versus no change in weights is going to help close gaps from what we have right now. We also have to think about, oh gosh, every time I bump my house, this goes. Um, the other thing we have to think about is, again, I mentioned with respect to equity concerns, we have to think about sort of this issue of budget maximization and budget minimization, where it may be the case that some districts are only able to spend up to the average because their taxpayers aren't going to allow them to spend over that. But because of that, they're actually spending too little on students who need additional resources. There are efficiency concerns, right? We talked about the administrative efficiencies. And again, these aren't fatal flaws, again, things to think about. Cost containment is something I think we need to be attentive to with this proposal, right? Because the average will likely over adjust for some districts. And right now, the weights, if they were calibrated appropriately, should provide, should put almost a governor on the top end of the spending threshold, right? You, it will cost you more if you're spending too many dollars, right? If you overspend because that local share comes back to your local taxpayers, we lose that with, right? We lose that sort of mechanism within the formula for putting a governor on the top end that is supposed to be there with the weights. It's not working very well right now because our weights are miscalibrated, but that was one of the big design considerations that policymakers put in place when they talked about and crafted Act 60, which was actually a pretty smart thing. I think we have to be realistic with ourselves around politicization of categorical grants. And, you know, sort of if we think about when we have grants line itemed out, there's always a potential for legislative manipulation. We'd like to say that won't happen, but we also know that current legislatures cannot bind future legislatures in spending decisions. And when we have line items out there, I know we've all seen in lean times, you know, those numbers can be big. And that can become a that can become a political debate. The reality is we have to remember that these aren't for programs, these are cost adjustments. There's something very different. And so we have to think carefully about to what extent do we want cost adjustments in this state politicized. Um, the third thing is, is, and this is related to politicization, I think there was some language in an earlier task force report. I know it's out now. But if the language was there, then somebody thought about it. So I think we need to just sort of make sure that we're keeping our eye on that, which is when these numbers get large, we need to be careful about conversations around competition for resources between, for example, economically disadvantaged students, ELL students, and other groups or other kinds of priorities in the state budget. But these are cost adjustments. And that's different than um, uh, grant programs for arts education, for example. These are basic operating expenses, and this is what, how we equalize opportunity in the state. And then the last one I want to just point out is this issue of timing. You know, our report came out in 2020. Um, uh, you know, the weights we have are pretty miscalibrated. I think there's quite a bit of evidence at this point that we have some issues of equity and efficiency in our city, right? We have some issues around both those, those, top, both those topics in our existing funding formula. And we're here we are in the in, you know almost the end of January. And so I think the question is, is you know, what what can we do realistically right now? Right. And you know, what is the what is the legislative appetite for and capacity to make the other kinds of statutory and regulatory changes that might be necessary to make the cost equity proposal a strong proposal at this point? And I think the task force was really wise and how they frame this out in their report by saying like, here's an idea, but it needs a lot more work and we need to talk about it and we need to be thinking about these things. And I think that was really sage advice on the part of the task force. But we're sort of in this moment where we still have 
inequities in our system, right? School funding, you know, town meeting day happens regardless. And so, you know, I think we have to think about this issue of timing and urgency and sort of what is the capacity and what we can do now. And also with regard to legislative appetite and capacity, you know, I think the question of the cost equity proposal is going to be not just that, it's the cost equity proposal, at least from our assessment, is an and and both kind of proposal, which is if in fact we go that in order for that route to work well, there will have to be other kinds of systemic changes in our in our formula. And can that be done in a short order? I don't know. I think that's up to you. Um, and I think also, you know, we need to think about the fact that, you know, most states are continually evaluating and updating and refining their funding formula. It's very unusual for a state to have gone this long without any refinement. And so I just bring up the issue of timing as sort of a trade-off here. You know, is there a short-term, is there a short-term short-term solution and a long-term plan? There that could be. So again, from our perspective, um, these are two viable proposals. Um, I think I said in the in my testimony before the for the task force, you know, I think sometimes it's easy to poke holes at what you know because the knowns are the knowns. Um, you know, I lay, lay out these trade-offs. It's not so much to um, tear down that proposal. It's just these are things I think we need to consider and think about and be real thoughtful around as we're talking about that proposal going forward because they're all things we can design around. We can create complementary policies and do things to address lots of these trade-offs. But that's other policy work and that's other kinds of sort of contemplation that would have to go on. So I know I've been asked for a recommendation. Um, I, I, I saw that in Ruth's note. I've been real careful not to say one or the other. I bet what I think in, in talking with um, my colleagues who wrote the report, I think we would say this, is that from our perspective, based on our sort of empirical findings, you know, the weights right now are quite miscalibrated. And that's generating some pretty significant issues of equity, um, both for taxpayers and for students in the state, and that there really is an immediate need to sort of address that. And again, I think the question is, is what can be done sort of legislatively in a more short term versus long term perspective? And, and rather than saying, like, do this or do that, I think we, what we'd rather say is that we see that there's an urgent need. And we just want to raise the question of whether or not in the next few months there is enough time and energy and capacity to fully sort of develop and deal with some of these contingencies that would make the cost equity proposal sort of really strong policy proposal. Is there enough capacity and time to do that? So I'll stop there rather than I I'll take this up. So open for questions, comments. Senator Pierce, I, I, Senator Cummings, do you want to? I, 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 do you want to take the uh, floor and call on people, or should I? Madam or, Chair, I you, know. Madam Chair, you may have been muted. Yeah. You are muted, Madam Chair. In which case, I move. No, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> what you can't move without me. All right. Um, What's up, Professor? I, I, I hear you trying artfully to not take a strong position and I won't press you there even though I have to make a strong take I don't get to tiptoe but but I want to make sure I understand what you are saying and um I think I kind of heard you say a small tweak would lean people to change the weightings if we go into the categorical aid we have more work to do and it's potentially more complicated to get it right. Is that is that a fair summary? I think we would agree with the task force on that. Um, and I think the task force said that, you know, that the cost equity proposal needs more work. Um, and in my sort of trade-offs, what we try to do is identify, like, here's some considerations that we think need more thinking and likely need more work, right? Which would either be more analytics, but less on the analytic side and more thinking about how, what kinds of complementary policy or complementary kinds of things would need to go along with this to ensure that that grafting this new approach to our existing structure 
doesn't result in other kind of unwanted or unintended effects, right? Because what we're what what the cost equity does, right, is it basically takes an entirely different and relatively unknown in this in this context approach to cost adjustment and grafts it on to what is already a very complicated school funding system that operates very differently than any other state. And the two things that, that we have to pay attention to when we're thinking about grafting this on are its interactions with local control and this self-equalization, right? And from our assessment, there are, there are considerations for how we do that well so that we don't end up with these other unwanted effects. If in fact there's more time, there might be other kinds of structural changes that could be contemplated to the larger school funding system that would really make a cost equity proposal strong. For example, moving to a foundation formula, thinking about raising the yield to create a minimum spending threshold. Like there are other things, right, that sort of adjust this or complementary policies around um, thinking about sort of differential tax rates at the top minimum spending threshold right like those all those things sort of this fair game on the policy front but that's a lot of conversation to have and you're talking about fairly significant structural changes both to the funding system and other kinds of policies and we're still operating in this milieu that is vermont where we have local control over spending and we have self-equalization on the tax side and it, that only works if we that, that's only fair and fair measured from both a student perspective and a taxpayer perspective if we are appropriately equalizing local spending decisions proportional right and when we put the average in there that you we break that is that a problem maybe not but for it not to be the problem, we're gonna to have to do other things to make sure it's not a problem. Does, does that help, Senator Pearson? Sort of. Um, you know, it's every, every, the more I learn, the more cloudy it gets. Um, well, there are a lot but... of if thens. So how about, how about I simplify it this way? I think there are fewer if thens, right? With respect to updating the weights at this point than there are with the cost equity proposal. Right, we we know what's we know how the weights work. We know where the where we know what's not so great about them. Right, we also know that we also know that if they're properly calibrated, what those intended effects will look like. We don't know a lot of things over here yet, and but we can anticipate some of those things. And if we want to anticipate those things and not end up in a position that is worse off than what we are now, right? We're gonna to need to design around those things at the same time as putting in place the cost equity proposal. Do you, do you, do you um, Madam Chair, if I could just follow up with one question. Do you, a lot has been made about the, this concern that if you just increase the weights, there's no reason, there's no guarantee that the schools will spend that money really delivering necessary uh, assistance mm -hmm. to English language learners, for instance. Um, and I, I guess I, my thinking is that that is clearly true on paper, but in reality, the great majority of English language learners reside in a few, very few districts and those schools are clamoring for resources to be to a, to be able to adequately educate those kids. And so, do, in your research, do you have any reason to believe the schools that are actually uh, helping the whatever it is, 70, 80, 90 percent of our ELL students would uh, that that's a real risk in those? districts in other words understanding we're not going to do this perfectly i don't want to design a system that is is sort of more protective of of the entire system and actually misses out on on the few schools that are are in fact 
uh, working with this population, if that makes sense. That's my concern. Okay, let me answer that question on a couple different parts, Senator. First, um, under either proposal, unless the state puts in sort of performance-based standards for funding, neither proposal, because we rely on local control, has any assurances that dollars get spent a certain way, right? Neither of them do that. The way that we could do that is through strengthening the educational under sort of existing policy frameworks is through strengthening the educational quality standards, which are regulation. And those regulations are going to be opened up sh shortly by the state. Board. So either proposal, we don't have policy lever unless you design a policy lever and you could design this for the weights and you could design it for cost equity too, right? Both of them. Either proposal, we have no way right now of saying district X, you have to spend this, or this is this is what you this is, right? Or you need to do these things with dollars. Okay. That's our local control. The second thing I would say is we have no evidence in our study that districts in the state who who serve the largest proportions of English language learner students spend money unwisely or ineffectively. We have no evidence either way, right? Like we have no evidence of that. Um, what I can say about ELL students, and I think you started to mention this in your comment, is that because we are, have concentrations of ELL students in some places, we also have a situation where we have problems with economies of scale at other places in the state where we have really small numbers, right? And we have fixed costs and it's really great and they don't get federal money. What that means is for ELL, and we talk about this in one of our memos, is it makes it really challenging to develop a, a funding program for ELL students in a state that is going to be universally satisfactory for all these different kind of contexts. They're just really different. In some regards, that's a little bit unique to Vermont because we do have these concentrated refugee ready settlement sites that have large concentrations, not just of ELL students, but multiple languages and other kinds of learning needs versus itinerants and other kinds of programs in other parts of the state, which is why in our first memo, um, when we were asked to comment on this, we, we did say that you, there may be some policy room here to think about, to get creative with how we think about funding, funding for ELL programs in the state. That said, in thinking that through, we're going to need to make sure that we adequately fund those programs. And what we know from our research is that the ad on average in the state, the additional per pupil spending number is around $22,000 for an ELL student. So in our second memo, we talk about, well, then given some of these, right, so given some of these sort of unevenness around the state and sort of what these programs look like, there might be, there might be some options for districts could opt into a weight where they could opt into a grant program with a fixed cost with, with a fixed amount that dealt with some of the economies of scale. There's always an option for a reimbursement program, right, which is what we have right now under special ed, although we're transitioning for that. But there are policy options here, but I think it is, it, it, it is good to recognize that ELLs in the state pose a different kind of challenge in terms of figuring out like what is the most appropriate cost adjustment. But that's different than going down sort of the rabbit hole of saying some districts spend dollars wisely and other districts do not spend wisely. It's that I think the programs are really different. Does that help, Senator? Yes, it does. Thank you. Madam Chair, you're muted again. <laughs> I got rid of the, I had the house phone up here and it's gone off several times. It's gone. Um, the, uh, I think what you pointed out is a couple things. One is we do have a self-equalizing tax rate. A penny on the tax rate raises the same amount of money. But what we've discovered is that some communities can afford that extra penny better than other communities. We tend to have a bunch of very small, poor, rural communities and a couple of larger. And then we have some larger uh, districts. 
And so th that ability to pay comes into all of this. But I've been here since Act 60. Um, we have talked about tax rates. We've talked about uh, cost containment. We've talked about, but we have never talked about the rate, the weights, and they play a seemingly uh, important role in how much money school or in what form they're getting it. I, uh, it's kind of like, you know, transportation um, funds. We, we don't talk about those. They're a given. So I think it's good. One thing that I spent this morning listening to schools and the mental health issues they're facing with kids and the pressures. And I'm not sure how much capacity our schools have to absorb an entirely new system right now, which is something I think as we're playing with this, we might want to consider in terms of timing or in terms of do we stick with what the schools know and update the rates and then continue. We may be putting ELL out as a trial. We'll see, we'll see you know, if doing an, an equity payment there, does it work and how well does it work? But one thing I would say, Senator Cummings, and I think you were spot on about the tax rates and district and, and town's ability to pay. If we have a town right now that is um, has lower wealth, right, and that town is not appropriately weighted, they're underweighted, mm -hmm. dollars are too expensive in that town, right? And so it means that that town has less capacity to spend. And so I think what when we can see that in our data, right, that systematically town when we adjust these weights we see tax capacity going to places that previously where spending has been really hard now one of the things we raise in our report though is that there this is part of that local control right and, and local taxpayers is that just because you create tax capacity doesn't right. mean that a locality might take the tax capacity and so one of the things we recommended in our report is that if along with this, right, remember we talked about complementary policies, a complementary policy might be to say, if you get a, if you get tax capacity from this, you can't take that as a tax cut. The, the, the intent is that you're supposed to make those investments or some portion of those investments. So, and I just offer that example, but I think, I think you're really on to an important point, right? Like the fact that the weights have been miscalibrated have actually created the situation that you're talking about. Right. And if the weights were in theory in the self equalizing system, in theory, that if the weights are calibrated properly, then some of that should go away. Right. Mm -hmm. Should. Okay. Um, Senator Hardy, I know you know this. So I'm going to see if anybody else has a question at this point. Okay. Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Professor Colby, um, for your testimony. Um, I feel like I could like listen to it in my sleep and I probably do, <laughs> and you probably do too at this point. Um, um, but I just, I, I wanted to point out, I don't know if you saw the pros and cons list that I went over with the committee yesterday. Mine was a more simplified version than yours, but it was pretty much the same as yours with you oh, know, good. slightly different. <laughs> slightly different takes on it, but it was a pretty similar list. And it was a list that Representative Kornheiser and I put together earlier this session. So, um, you know, I I would debate on a few little finer points, but overall, I think that, um, you know, I, I think your pros and cons list is is good. The one exception and is that I, I think there's more more to be said about ELL. And, and I know that Senator Pearson in particular is very in, concerned obviously as am I about making sure we get that right and I think that's the one that we that's the reason that's the one area that we pulled out 
the task force mm -hmm. pulled out to say we need to do something different here mm -hmm. because it doesn't fit the same um, parameters that the other weights and other categories do in, in the same way. And I appreciated you, you know, pointing that out. And I think that's why we're sort of holding off on that conversation. Um, and the education committee's having it first um, because mm -hmm. it really is a very uh, focused educational program as well as a cost um, adjustment. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the other categories are more cost adjustments mm -hmm more generically i mean i don't want to oversimplify it but um well i think they're all cost adjustments but i think that we have programmatic challenges in this state that make it difficult to come up with a uniform cost adjustment in the same kind of way right and yeah we point that out in our original report and all of our memos and that ell is a special circumstance and i think we are all we would concur with you on the fact that there's room for thinking around I would call it creative thinking around how might we do ELL better, given the fact that the program, how we provide high quality services for English language learners around the state should look really different in different contexts. And that makes coming up with some sort of average or some sort of uniform way really difficult to do, yes. right? Right, exactly. So I look forward to more conversations about yeah. this, but the other four categories are a little bit, I wouldn't say easier, but I'm gonna say easier <laughs> to deal with the the enrollment, the poverty, the the grade level, and the school size. And and that's where I feel like this committee needs to make the that choice between these two. And I will just say, mm -hmm. I, and I, if anybody's wondering what I'm thinking um, as the co-chair of the task force, um, that I agree that we have limited amount of time and um, moving forward with um, a cost equity proposal right now may be a big task that we're not able to get done in this session. Um, and we need to do something this session. So uh, I'm hoping that we um, are able to understand and as a committee and, 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 and move forward with the set of weights that are proposed in your Okay. The famous October 28th, 2021 memo. <laughs> I've cited it so many times, it feels famous to me. Um, so anyway, just- I'll take famous of your there, there we go. Um, I'd like to have a couple minutes for committee discussion and we've got our next group on energy savings accounts. So um, new thing, Senator Pearson. So uh, let me just get clear, Madam Chair, are we going to talk about it right now? I mean, it is special to have Professor Colby with us. Who's yes, I, I think um, we've heard from Professor Colby. I'm trying to figure out uh, what the committee might like to know. Um, we haven't heard, you know, we just scratched the surface of what's there. I'm going through our flow chart that we saw yesterday um, with the pros and cons of the weighting versus uh, the equity payments. ELL we know is a separate issue. Mm. It will come to us, I assume, with if it's got money attached to it um, from education, but for all the other categories, um we in, in, we have that so I, I would love to ask professor colby about um the the poverty yeah. metric and and the shift um for so, other reasons in the past i've been interested in a in a family income sort of reporting particularly because we've i've been one of the people looking at universal school meals and it mm -hmm. solves a problem there so it immediately caught my eye but now i'm starting to wonder what you think and this is my question the impact of um if, if we sort of accept that historically there's a been a problem with our our measurement and our weight for poverty and we sort of are saying, good, we need to address this. And as we address it, we shift to a much broader 
metric is there a risk that that we we sort of um maybe jump to a more a more fair system but but overlook a correction in the in the in the sense of um you know as we fix it we go to a new measure and and so we don't kind of address some of the history there do you see my question I see your question um i'm going to answer this in a couple parts again um the first thing i want to say is let's i think it's important to be clear what our existing poverty measure is in the weights okay that we use for weights it is a hodgepodge at best right of a bunch of different things, right? It can, it sort of gets sort of family nutrition, but it also double it also counts any student who's ELL as a, impoverished. So we have this situation where we have ELL students counted in the poverty weight and also in, in as ELL students, and the existing measure of economic disadvantage is a very restrictive one, right? It's based on sort of connections of a household to nutrition benefits that we get right from more generally from another agency. So we don't have that correspondence with a particular school in the same kind of way. And we have we have a problem where poverty, where poverty is actually capturing not just poverty, it's capturing ELL and poverty. It also is multiplicative in the, which means that it counts for a lot. Let's just say it that way, right? It, it, it counts for more than other categories. So the task force, I think, did a good job in really trying to dive into this issue of how do we measure poverty, which is problematic, not just in Vermont, it's problematic everywhere. It's a really hard thing to do. In our study, in our original report, we tested out a number of different measures and said like, of the available measures, free and reduced price lunch seems to be the best measure that we have available, at least to us. Um, I know uh, Representative Kornheiser in particular took some interest in thinking about like how we might even improve on collecting those data, you know. So my answer to your question is, is one, the measure we have is not very good, right? It's, it's very restrictive. I don't, we know it's not doing a very good job of measuring economic, the extent of economic disadvantage, and it's completed with the number of students who are ELL. Okay. So from our perspective, keeping it is not a good thing, right? That we need to shift to something. What would the criteria be for a shift? Making sure that we're not counting ELL in poverty and ELL in a separate category. Right? We need we need to break that apart. So it's pure, right? We've got a poverty and we we're in a measure of economic disadvantage, and we have a measure of English language learners. That'd be the first thing. The second thing is, is this kind of gets at your other point, like, so FRL is not as stringent of a measure of poverty, right? So we're going to have, we're going to identify more students and that's going to, that's more distributed right, across the state. That's going to have impacts, right, for weighting right, because we've distributed the impacts. And so this is really, I think the second decision that we would say is, you got to make a decision like at what point are you going to declare a student economically disadvantaged what we know in the research right is that students who are impoverished and by using impoverished we're using sort of federal guidelines for income on average costs more to educate so if we're using frl which is tied to that federal benchmark then we have a decent degree of confidence in saying if you're using frl you are identifying students who are economically disadvantaged enough that we know from research require additional resources to succeed in schools. So is the measure they're proposing ideal? No, I don't think, I, I, and, but I also don't know that we have a better measure right now that we can use. But there are these trade-offs, as you notice, Right, that come with moving from a more restrictive to a more generalized measure of poverty with how that will work in the weighting calculation. I think we're gonna have to do a few runs to really understand the interaction. Um, at times this feels like building an atomic bomb and there's a reaction and an, you know, a counter reaction and um, I think that at some point, I'd 
asked Brad James to do us a couple of winner loser scenarios, um, no names attached. So we aren't influenced, but to understand how all these things, he did one, but I can't say I understand except that they do interact, but if that's a good thing or a bad thing, and, and I don't know yet. Um, if I may, Senator Cummings? Yeah. Um, the one thing I would say is that moving from the existing poverty measure, which again, double counts ELL and is multiplicative to an additive measure of poverty, right? Which means it holds the same weight as all the other things, right? And right. doesn't include ELL, is an improvement over what we have now. Okay, so why would then the question is is how do you want to measure if, poverty then? Right? If English language learners are living in poverty, why wouldn't we count them? They are counted. Right? Okay. They would actually right. So right now we actually double count ELL students in the weights. Ah, okay. Because then, all right, any then. student who's ELL is automatically counted as impoverished and as an ELL student. That, that makes things, that, that shouldn't be, right? Like the weight shouldn't work that way. The way the okay. weight should work is if you're impoverished, you're weighted for this. And if you're ELL, you're weighted for this. So okay. it's, not that, it's not that an impoverished ELL student wouldn't be weighted. They'd be weighted as an impoverished student and right with the weight for poverty and the weight yeah. for ELL. Right yeah. now what we do is we're, it's a counting problem. Because when we're counting impoverished students, we're also counting anyone who's ELL, regardless of the resources that they have in the home. That's what I'm thinking. Not everybody is necessarily poor. Right. That's right. And you want these to be additive, right? So all these weights hold, okay. right? hold right, the same weight in the calculation, right? So we're not compounding the effects of one, of one kind of disadvantage over another, right? So it's a far more fair system that way. It also okay. means that your that that your adjustments are more pure, right? Like I'm adjusting for economic disadvantage. I'm adjusting for ELL, right? And I'm doing it appropriately that way. All right. And Tammy, I just want uh, Professor Colby. I just want to add for uh, the, the weights that um, <laughs> the weights that are in the famous October 28th memo already are recalibrated or recalculated for this particular right. issue. That's correct. So okay. That's, that's correct. one of the things the task force spent a lot of time on understanding okay. and then asking that the weights be redone so that they're the correct number. Um, and that's part of the reason you saw the shift in ELL weight, right? Because when we, because before we were kind of counting ELL as poverty and we were counting kind of ELL out here. And so the weights were capturing them in two places, right? When we broke it apart and we said just poverty and just ELL, this is like we purified both of those weights, which is why they shifted the way they did. The poverty weight actually came down because we're no longer double counting ELL. The ELL weight went up because we're only counting ELL there. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to have to wrap this up because our next set of and I think we've probably absorbed as much as we're going to absorb for one afternoon. But committee, um, since I think we're going to take a lot less time on that uh, merged market on Friday, I'm going to try and um, get some discussion about A, how, how we're feeling about which basis weights or uh, equity payments and then, um, or, a, or a hybrid, and then um, we'll figure out where the next step is and where we're going. But I think, um, and if you, you know, you you want further information or further somebody, I'm gonna um, ask if we haven't already uh, the school superintendents to come in. Um, I'd like to just get a sense as to how much they feel that they and their, you know, that they can handle at this moment. And that might, because we are going to, I'm assuming, do some transition step and um, be ready, you know, to, to think about that too.
And I know I have at least one school board member who has contacted me and I've told her she can come in and talk. Um, so that's where we are. All right. So if I may, Madam Chair, thank you. I also put in the chat for, for people on Zoom my email address. If there are specific questions that any of you have as follow up, I'm happy to try to respond to them. So that's feel free great. to reach out. Thank you. And I'm happy to come back if it's helpful to you. I think we're at the point where we're still learning enough to ask intelligent questions. Great questions. <laughs> we're working our way through. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, committee. Yeah. Thank you.